My name is Bob Cara, or Cara. I'm half Spanish, half Dutch. Uh, I have been a new. Te Dr. Kruger and I are the two New Testament professors at uh, RTS, at the Charlotte version of RTS, and I've been here 22 years. Um, I started with Ann Guerin uh, 22 years ago. Uh, I mentioned to my wife that I'm doing uh, this women's study as the backup for Mike. And she said, well, have you ever spoken to that many women before? Uh, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, a lot of times in my denomination, we'll, we have a, sort of a book of the Bible that the women, uh, the circles, if you know this old word, uh, women's circles, Bible studies. And so a lot of times they'll have me teach the leaders of that. So there might be 50 or 60, but I think there's more than 50 or 60. However, there are several times that I spoke to more women than this. Uh, I was a student at uh, RTS in the mid-80s at the Jackson version, which was the only version then. And uh, many of the uh, wives had a ministry to uh, women. Uh, there was a women's prison uh, in Jackson. So actually, I spoke about 10 times at a women's prison, of which there are about 200 women uh, there. And I'll stop making any kind of analogies to the... <laughs> women's prison, but that was very interesting. Uh, actually, one time, uh, in my background, I was a basketball player, and one time we played, my college team played a maximum security men's basketball team. That, that, if you, afterwards, if you want to ask me some of those, that was a very interesting experience, completely different than the women's uh, prison. Okay, enough of uh, introductory uh, comments. Uh, Mike tells me that we're in uh, Romans, so that's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and we're at chapter 3, uh, 1 through 8 is our section, and just to give a little uh, kind of, so book, Bible, Romans, chapter 3, 1 through 8, and he's in this uh, now, Paul is in this long section from the middle of chapter 1 all the way through the end of chapter 3. He's making the point everybody is a sinner, both Jew and Gentile. What's happening at the end of chapter 2 before we go into chapter 3? At the end of chapter 2, he's saying relative to justification or relative to being declared righteous by God, all Jews are sinners. So he's ending all Jews are sinners relative to justification, as you see in my notes. Then he's going to go through three, uh, 1 through 8. We'll skip that for a second. Then after our section, 9 through uh, the end of 20 is going to be the famous wrap-up. Everybody has sinned, if you look at verse 9. What then? Are Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged that all, oh, both Jews and J Greeks, are under sin. And then he goes through all these Old Testament quotes. And then in verse 19, he re-summarizes everything. And oh, that ends the everybody's a sinner section. And then 321 starts the grand, heartwarming, but Christ's work is what saves us. Christ's work is, uh, is what we are based on when we're declared righteous. Okay, but what is 3, 1 through 8? Looking at my uh, notes there, subset asterisk. 3, 1 through 8 is somewhat of a parenthesis dealing with objections and misunderstandings concerning Paul's argument, Jews have no advantage relative to justification. Again, it's Jews have no advantage relative to justification. And you could come up with some theoretical um, objections to that. And that's what he is going to do in 1 through 8. Let me go through one, another little issue here before we read the text. Now, are these objections theoretical or are they actual real objections that he has heard? And that's in the scholar world. That's a big uh, question there. And as I say in my notes... Uh, are these objections theoretical? That is, has Paul surmised that these are possible Jewish objections, theoretical ones, or uh, are they actual objections that he's heard from Jewish people? Now, if you run to verse 8, there he does talk about real objections. Uh, if you see, depending on what version you have in the middle of verse 8, if some people slanderously charge us with saying, so some of these objections are from real people. Are they all from real people? We don't know. They probably are. But whether they're theoretical objections 
or real objections, it doesn't matter. Paul's going to say they're wrong, and he'll give the right answer. Okay, one more comment before we read the text. Um, sometimes in my Paul course, you know, you can't say everything about every text in Paul, and sometimes I'll, you know, you got to figure out as a professor which ones you're going to go through in all, uh, all these Pauline books, and so I'll have a logic in my head. Okay, i got to talk about this doctrinal topic. Oh, this text relates to that. This text relates to that. But sometimes I'll show some texts in Paul are just very tight logic, and the first time you read it, it's kind of hard to figure out. So occasionally I'll have a hard-to-figure-out text in Paul, and then usually I'll say, after you read one of those, okay, they're not all like that. Uh, don't think that this is the normal. Um, and this one, when, if you just read this straight through, and you don't see he's responding to three theoretical or real objections, it can be a little disconcerting. Now, you're going to see, once I tell you what the objection is that he's responding to, it is going to make sense right on the surface. So therefore, uh, uh, the Westminster Confession uh, famously says, like the question is, all the, is all the Bible equally clear? The answer is no, because, in fact, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, Peter says that some of the things in Paul are hard to understand. So if you say all the Bible is equally clear, you're against the Bible, because the Bible says some parts are hard to understand. But the Westminster Confession famously says, but those things necessary for salvation and life and knowing about Christ are clearly propounded in one place or another in the Scriptures. So the Scriptures are clear on what we need for salvation, Christ, and to live a life, but not everything in the Scripture is equally clear. And so when you first read this, Again, you're going to go, well, what? Um, but we'll unpack it and try and make it clearer than it is right off the bat. Okay. Uh, the written word of God, Romans 3, 1 through 8, and then we'll go back through the text. Again, somewhat of a parenthesis in uh, all Jews are sinners. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Oh, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. But by no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Amen, and let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, aid us in understanding uh, the Bible aid us in understanding this text, aid us in seeing the glory of Christ, seeing what good we can do for our neighbor, and convict us of any sin, realizing it's the work of Christ that justifies us and not our good works. I pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, uh, as you see in my notes, I have objection number one, and we're going to look at the first two verses. Uh, so the objection he's going to try and say, the objector would say, by Paul's logic of justification, there's no advantage to being a Jew. Okay. Why be a Jew? If everybody's a sinner, what's the advantage of being a Jew? So the question would be, let's read the text, three, but one and two. And he just explicitly says it. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So, is there, any is there no advantage to being a Jew? My answer, Paul's answer, wrong. There is an advantage. There's many advantages, but here the advantage is the Jews had the oracles of God. So again, when he says there's no advantage to being a Jew, it's relative to justification, relative to being declared righteous by God, not in every single way there's no advantage of being a Jew. Okay, that's the basic point there. Um, 
And here he brings up the oracles of God. If you run in your Bible over to chapter 9, he will run off more advantages, 9, 4, and 5, and just to show you them. And reading the text, uh, Romans 9, 4, and 5, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs from their race. According to the flesh is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Okay, back to Romans 3. So there you see is a longer list than just the oracles of God. Now the word oracles in the Bible, not that we use it in modern English too often, but uh, oracles, as it says in my notes there, with no context means spoken words. And here he probably means the Old Testament scripture, God's speaking in uh, covenants, Christ's speaking, because Christ was according to the flesh, and also even New Testament apostles at that point, uh, spoken uh, words. That God's spoken words, and some of those spoken words get inscripturated, in other words, become uh, scripture. Uh, and as you see in my notes there, I'm going to talk, if you go to verse, just with your eye, down to verse 4, he's going to quote God. Again, that's part of the oracles of God. We have the Old Testament. He's going to quote an Old Testament verse, and we'll get to that uh, verse in a minute. Uh, and based on that logic, notice, and this happens often in the Bible, it'll say God speaks, and then it'll quote the Bible, showing a close association, and in this case, an exact association that God's oracles, his speaking, equals, in those situations, the scripture text. And so uh, that's an uh, angle going on here. But just to show that even better, why don't you run over to the book of Galatians. Uh, so we're in Romans, go several to the right, you're going to see the Corinthians, and then you'll see Galatians. We're going to go to chapter 3, verse 8, and we're showing how the scripture many times equates God speaking to Scripture, and here it does it in an odd way, hence that's why I'm going to bring it up. Uh, if you look in your Bible 3, 6, he quotes from the Old Testament, just as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Verse 7, know then that those who are faith are the sons of God, and the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Notice, the Scripture foreseeing, as if the Scripture is a human. You see, he so associates Paul, Scripture, with God speaking, he even metaphorically or personifies, takes the Scripture and says the Scripture foresees. That's an amazing uh, verse there. Just uh, sort of an extreme version of an unbelievably high view of Scripture that Paul has. And in the uh, academic world that uh, Mike and I are in, some, in fact, in a couple of weeks we'll be going uh, to uh, there's two conferences we go to every year. One, Evangelical Theological Society, 3,000 conservative professor types. But then that, as that ends, the next day starts SBL, Society of Biblical Literature. That's 10,000 professors, of which the 3,000 are conservative, 7,000 are less than conservative. Um, and in those world, okay, so these are all what we would call liberal professors, uh, many of them explicitly atheistic now, you say to them, is the Bible the word of God? Oh, what are you, you get it crazy? But if you said, do the Bible writers themselves think the Old Testament is the word of God? Well, of course. So it's not, so in the liberal academic world, it's not that they don't think that Paul thinks the Old Testament was written by God. They just don't, they think that's what Paul thinks. He's just wrong. Uh, would be uh, their view. And that's the world that uh, a lot of times uh, Mike and I uh, are in. So sometimes they can agree to us. Yes, we agree that the scripture says that. They just don't think it's really true. Okay, back to my notes, back to uh, Romans 3. I have their modern meaning, and some of these will relate to the study questions you'll have at your table, but uh, modern meaning of the first objection. Uh, the triune God is a speaking God. One of the attributes of God is that he speaks to us, uh, and in, in, this day, in this time, uh, through the Bible primarily. Uh, and so, and then relating it to uh, what advantage is it to be a Jew, being in a Bible preaching and reading church is an advantage. 
Even if it's true that automatically hearing the Bible doesn't make you a Christian, okay, that's true, but it's still an advantage to be in a Bible-preaching, Bible-reading uh, church. And maybe that's stating the obvious to you, uh, and there'll be a sort of a study question about that later. Uh, just this past weekend, I was in uh, Dallas, Texas, and doing a men's retreat with uh, uh, a church that actually has three of the RTS Charlotte graduates, the head pastor, the women's coordinator, a women, woman, and the associate pastor. And uh, interestingly, about three or four different men at this men's retreat told me this similar type of story was that when they came to that church, and this would have been true of a lot of Bible-believing churches, but they happened to be coming out of less than conservative churches and grew up in a variety of ways, and they say, and the first time I went to Providence Presbyterian, actually someone was trying to explain the Scripture. I've been going to church my whole life, never heard a sermon where they explained the Scripture. And maybe some of you can relate to that, and maybe some of you can't, but realize, especially those that can't, there are many churches that they don't really explain the Scripture at all. The sermon has, they don't start with the Bible, it's just rambling on. Um, and maybe some of the things they say are biblically true, but they're not trying to explain the Scripture. And for at least those four gentlemen that talked to me, the fact that someone would read a paragraph and try and explain it was so wonderful to them, like, oh, it makes sense. You could actually read the Bible and make sense of it. Okay. It is advantage to be at a Bible-believing uh, church for many reasons, but one, you just hear about the Bible. Okay, let's move on uh, in Paul. Okay, looking at my notes, the sec second objection, which you sort of have to get in your head before you read this little two verses. Okay, so... The objector, and probably a real-life person, may have said to Paul, Paul, you're saying that not all Jews are saved. If that's true, Paul, God is unfaithful. Okay, that's the objection. Paul, you're saying not all Jews are saved, and he is saying that. Therefore, Paul, you are also saying, even though he's not really, you're also saying that God is unfaithful. Because didn't God promise that all Jewish people would be saved. Okay, that's the assumption going on. Given that, let's read the text. So I'm at the Romans 3, 3 and 4. What if some were unfaithful, meaning some Jews were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified, you God, may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. We'll, we'll get to the details of that in a second. And for, when you first read it, you may be missing what all the little angles are going on there because there's several that you got to get in your head. Okay, reading my notes. Okay, is God unfaithful if not all Jews are saved? Wrong. God never promised that he would save all Jews. And he never promised to not call sin a sin. Therefore, God is still faithful to his word and truthful even when Jews sin. And his answer is going to be, read the Old Testament, which will be his quote. He'll do this similarly in uh, 9 through 11. Okay, let's try and understand how the quote proves the point. Um, the, reading my notes, Paul quotes Psalm 51.4. Let's run back to Psalm 51.4. The book of Psalms in the middle of the Bible. So run to the middle of the Bible. Chapter 51, and I think when I read this, you'll recognize uh, this psalm. This is David speaking. Our verse is going to be the second half of four, but I'm going to start at one, and we'll go through four. So I'm at Psalm 51. Uh, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. So here David is admitting his sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, 
have I sinned? Now, actually, he may have sinned against other people, but comparatively, it's only against God I have sinned. So again, for against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Okay, what he's saying there is, David is admitting God called him a sinner. That's the key point to know. God called him a sinner, and then he admits, yes, I am a sinner. And more than that, you have mercy on me. This is, you know, I'm a sinner, and you have mercy on me. Uh, And the fact that I'm admitting I'm a sinner is proving your words correct. See, God called David a sinner. David admits he's a sinner. That is proving God's words correct. Correct. God is faithful to call David a sinner, and in addition, he's faithful to forgive David, who is a true believer. Okay, back to my notes. So I say there, Paul quotes uh, Psalm 51 and uh, in Romans 3, 4. David's confession of sin assumes that God had said that David was a sinner. Uh, God's statement of David's sin proves that God was faithful and true to his covenants. He's true to call sin a sin, and he's also true to show mercy uh, uh, when someone truly believes in God. Now, I do have a little sub asterisk there. Interestingly, in the context of Psalm 51, God calls David's sin a sin, but also shows covenant mercy to David as David was a true believer. Now, Paul could have used God's faithfulness in forgiving sins as his point, but that's not what he used. He used And he'll actually use that point later uh, in chapters 9 through 11. Uh, Here he's just using the point that God called David a sinner. David admitted he was a sinner. That proved true uh, God's uh, point that he was a sinner. And he could have used, to make that point, he could have used a hundred different places. Let's go to one other possible place. Might have been in the back of uh, Paul's mind, which is Psalm 116. There's a famous, well, it's not famous, but a little bit famous verse. Uh, so I'm at Psalm 116, verse 11. Uh, and again, here this, uh, the psalmist is in a problem. People are making fun of the psalmist. In verse 11, he says, I said in my alarm, All mankind are liars. And then the point will be, but God is not a liar. So that's a common statement that men are liars. Uh, God is truthful. Okay, back to my notes. This question about uh, uh, if not all Jews are saved, therefore is not God unfaithful comes up again in 9 through 11 in a big, long discussion. Reading my notes Uh, 9 through 11, similar questions will come up about God's faithfulness to his word to Israel. Another, didn't God promise by his spoken and written word that he would save Israel? Good question. The answer to that question, which just read the Old Testament and you get the answer, but the answer to the question, run to chapter 9, verse 6, is the famous line, which will be the second half of six, but reading six. So the the first question, did God's word fail to Israel? Verse six, no, it is not as though the word of God has failed. And here's the kicker, for not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all Israel is Israel. Not all true believing Israel equals all ethnic Israel. Not all Israel is Israel. Not all ethnic Israel is true believing Israel. Paul also uses the word remnant uh, in a whole bunch of places, and he'll use it in 9 through 11. A remnant means a subset of ethnic Israel. So there's uh, the Old Testament, Paul argues, and it's true, distinguishes between true believing Israel and all actual numbers of uh, Israelites. Okay, uh, uh, back to Romans 3. Uh, looking at my notes, I say they're modern meaning, uh, and this is stating the obvious. Everyone who says she was or is a Christian is not necessarily a Christian. Right? Saying one's a Christian does not make one a Christian. 
Uh, and then when God or God's true representative calls this person who said they were a Christian, her, calls her a sinner uh, and gives her an unfaithfulness of sin, maybe they've fallen away, whatever the situation is, ultimately it proves true uh, proves God true as a fake Christian is shown to be a liar. If there's someone who says they're a Christian and are doing just absolute, absolute unchristian things, or I'm a Christian, but I never go to church, whatever, and someone, God, the Bible, or one of the Bible's representatives, you, says, oh, as politely as you can, you're a liar, and that'll be one of the questions, how do we winsomely tell people, you're a liar, uh, but it's proving God true, because God said that's sin, and, and showing that, that pr- when someone who claims to be a Christian is not a Christian, and that is pointed out, that proves God true, because God said, just because you attend church, just because you're an Israelite, doesn't make one a, a Christian, and I, God, have said some people are liars and to show them their sin proves me, God, true. Because I have said that not all Israel is Israel. Not all people who attend church are true uh, believers. And then there'll be a discussion question, how to winsomely get that across to one of your buddies. Uh, okay, let's move on, 5 through 8. Okay, now reading my notes there in the bold, the objection. Okay, if our sin actually helps show God's faithfulness and truthfulness, if when someone is so out of bounds and we call them a liar, that shows God true, which is a good thing, to, right? It's a good thing to show God true. If it's a good thing to show God true, then maybe we shouldn't be punished for our faithlessness because we helped God. Maybe that person helped God by showing he was true. Wasn't that a good thing to do? And at some level, you think this is a silly one, but actually this is one that people were uh, complaining uh, to Paul about. Well, we're helping God in some way. Now, uh, let me read the, and actually he's going to break this into two parts, and I'll show the two parts in a second. So uh, that's sort of the big objection, and then as I read it, uh, you'll see uh, 5 and 6 are the first part of the objection, 7 and 8 are, are the second part. So let me read, read uh, 5 through 8. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak like in a human way. By no means. For then, how could God judge the world? Now, sort of the second angle on that. But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charged with saying, their condemnation is just. Okay. So this objection, uh, if my sin helps show God to be better, why not just keep sinning? Yeah. And why am I getting yelled at if I'm actually helping God by my uh, bad things? Now, everyone in the room is reasonably enough a Christian that this just seems so dumb uh, to you. Uh, however, we'll look at an angle with at least some people don't think it's dumb, as we'll see. Uh, okay, I say in my notes, wrong. This logic, in quotes, involves two absurdities. A, by that logic that you used, God could not judge anybody. He, you know, if your mistake is to the goodness of God and you don't want to be judged for that, well, then God can't judge anybody. We'll come back to that point. And second, that would in, your logic would involve the absurdity that doing evil would actually be a good thing to do. Uh, okay. Let's take the first objection, that God could not judge one. So concerning A, God could judge no one, and I'm uh, here in verse 5, rereading 5. If our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? Um, Using a rhetorical question, Paul notes that what the Old Testament and New Testament state often, God will judge the world. 
And in fact, backhandedly, the psalm that he quoted already implied God uh, was judging the world. But God will judge the world is in so many places uh, in the Bible. He's saying your logic would then deny that God will judge the world and call sin a sin. He will call sin a sin in the final judgment. Uh, and we'll, come, we'll say a few things about that in a second. Concerning B, uh, which is doing evil would be good, Paul just simply assumes that God has not designed the world so that humans, from their own perspective, are to purposely do evil so that good would come. Now, parenthesis, uh, of course, from God's providential control, it is true that humans may intend evil, but good can come out of it from God's perspective. And there's many famous verses about that. And if you, Genesis 50, 20, uh, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Uh, and you can look that verse up. So it's true that God can take your evil and make it work out to good. But from your perspective, you're not supposed to say, I will do evil so that good may come. And, and we're going to talk about that uh, sort of ethical principle in some detail uh, in a second. Okay, uh, next point. Uh, this thing about sin so that God will look better idea uh, comes up again, a different type of answer, a different tact to the answer. If you run over to Romans 6, 1, uh, and previously, Paul's talking about justification, that uh, we are not good enough to merit heaven. Only Christ's work can merit heaven. Uh, we're sinners. Look how great God's love for us is that he sent Christ to die for us. Then he gets to verse, chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? If God's grace is so great to talk about, Maybe I ought to sin more so we get more grace, okay? Um, and then he'll answer that objection. You can see it's a similar objection, but he's going to have a different tact in his answer, which is going to be, if Christ has truly saved you, he is truly giving you the ability to do good works. Uh, his answer in this one is uh, related to uh, God couldn't judge anybody uh, if... Uh, well, uh, I don't want to repeat the same thing. Okay, modern meaning for the A, about uh, God could not judge anybody. It is true. God will judge those who are ultimately unrepentant, the final judgment. This truth dovetails within the larger argument of uh, everybody's a sinner, right? Everybody's a sinner. If there's no judgment, like, well, who cares? Right? But everybody's a sinner and if you are unrepentant, you will be judged. That's part of the whole argument here. It's not just we're all sinners. It's we're all sinners, and we will have a judgment, which ratches up the problem. Um, uh, so reading my notes, God will judge those who are ultimately unrepentant. This truth dovetails with the larger argument that all are sinners and need the gospel. Why do they need the gospel? Because unrepentant sinners will be judged with wrath, and then I ask, uh, at what level do our non-Christian neighbors believe in the final judgment? Um, and you could talk about that at your table. What level do they really believe it? You know, it's the difficult answer there. Okay, let's look at verse 8. Part of the answer of, yeah, maybe I ought to lie more so that God's truth will be better shown that's an absurdity because, verse 8, then why not do evil that good may come? Why not do evil that good may come? Uh, reading my notes, modern meaning, and we'll talk about this for a few minutes. Paul's statement, why not do evil that good may come, is a refutation of the ethical, because it's not ethical, the ethical principle, the end justifies the means. The end justifies the means. So let's talk about that. How long do I have till Karen? Where's Karen? Do I end at 20 after? When do I end? And that's accurate? Is that accurate? I, I, my watch is lost here. Okay, thank you. Um, the end or ends justify the means. Now, first, let's just talk about that principle in and of itself. Okay. Um, 
the ends, meaning the goal, the consequence, is justified by the way, the means, I got there. Okay, that's what the ends justify the means. And this is a bad principle from a Christian perspective. Okay, so for instance, uh, I want to help, you know, you say you have a son, Johnny. I want to help Johnny get good grades. Okay, that's a good ends. That's a good goal. Oh, what means will I use? I will bribe the teacher. Uh, okay, uh, that would, from a Christian perspective, we would say the means, the ends, good goal, help Johnny, are not justified by the means. So we don't like the principle as a general rule. The ends justify the means. Now, it's never that simple, though, because there are some situations um, because from a Christian perspective, both the means and the ends have to be viewed uh, from a God perspective. And say something like, is it proper to take someone and put them in an eight-by-eight room and keep them there for five years? Okay. As a general rule, no, this is not a good thing to do. However, if someone has murdered or beat up somebody and they go through a trial uh, to protect others, we think it is an okay thing to put a prisoner there. So there, within that context, the means, which normally would not be good means, are appropriate to the situation. So uh, the ends justify the means, as a general rule, is bad. But, you know, pending on certain situations, uh, you know, it, it's okay, assuming it's from a God perspective, uh, and we can justify both the ends and the means. Okay. Uh, I have in my hand a famous book. And in fact, the concept, the wording that the end justifies the means actually comes from a guy guy named Machiavelli, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. Uh, He's living in the 1500s, uh, early 1500s, when he writes the famous book, The Prince, by which this uh, ethical principle uh, came about. That probably existed before that, but he becomes famous. He is writing to, in essence, the ruler of uh, his little section in Italy. He's worried that uh, Spain and France are going to come in and overrun Italy. Uh, He wants the Italian prince, and there's a variety of ones, really all to get together and have one guy rule it so they're stronger. So he's giving famous advice to the ruler, and then this uh, essay then gets published all over Europe and becomes a bestseller one, because some people hated it, but also because some people secretly uh, liked it. Uh, let me read to you a few quotes that I wrote down in the front here. And first, uh, let me read from the editor uh, uh, who makes an introductory comment here. The most important feature of Machiavelli's political thought is not the practical advice, and he has a lot of fun practical advice that I'll read in a second, uh, but it is that he establishes the principle that the political zone is an autonomous area subject to no other consideration than success. In other words, he takes religion, ethics, out of the political zone. All political decisions forget ethics, success, or the ends, is what matters. Now, Machiavelli himself has some level of ethics to himself, uh, but... It was a shocking statement because Augustine, a thousand years earlier, had written famous things that the ruler has to abide by God's laws and his means must be justified by the answer. Um, okay, let me read to you some quotes uh, uh, by Machiavelli. Um, if one is going to obtain a kingdom by force and evil means, and he's in favor of that, here's his practical advice. Do the evil in one quick stroke. Do not repeat the evil daily, because they won't like you. On the other hand, benefits should be given out little by little to to prolong the effects of them loving you. Uh, uh, A wise prince would see that his citizens 
will always in every sort and kind of circumstance have need of the state and of him. And then he will always find them faithful. So make it that they need you. Then they'll find you faithful. Uh, well, okay. Uh, it will be found that something which looks like virtue, if followed, will be to the prince's ruin, while something else which looks like vice, yet followed, brings him security and prosperity. So he goes through this whole litany of examples where virtue just, that'll create a problem. Do not be virtuous in these situations. Um, and here's another famous one of his. It's much safer to be feared than loved. Now, he does have some qualifications to that. First qualification. Men have less scruple in offending one who is loved than one who is feared. That's probably true, but it doesn't make it the right thing to do. For love is preserved only owing, well, okay, owing to the baseness of men and broken in every opportunity for this advantage. But fear preserves you by a dread of punishment which never fails. Now, he then goes... Uh, however, a prince should avoid hatred. Okay, fear good, but to get the hatred, that could create a problem for you. And his ex- two examples of not hatred is don't take property or women. Uh, okay, it's just in the text I'm just reading. Uh, <laughs> what's more important, doing great things or having faith? Princes who have done great things are beloved. Don't care about keeping the faith. He goes on a whole bunch of things about you got to act like you have faith or religion, but, but don't have it. You, but you got to act like you have it. A prince should appear merciful, faithful, human, religious, and upright, and to be so. But with a frame of mind, you, the prince, you should require not it to be so for yourself so that you may be able to know how to change and oppose it. Okay, so you're supposed to appear merciful, appear faithful, appear religious, but know in your own mind at a second you can change that and do the quick bad thing that you got to do. Now here's the one. Okay, there's the prince's idea. The end justifies the means. But here, interestingly, he talks about the people. For people, the means, and bad means, that a king uses to stay in power will be considered just if it helps them. Even the people will adopt this principle. Uh, The ends are justified by the means if you can show You're helping them. And let me read just a few uh, uh, other quotes. Oh, oh, no, can't read those quotes. Uh, (laughs) Caroline, is this okay? Where are you? Oh, she's gone. No wonder I keep looking around for Caroline. Uh, Another thing he talks about, interestingly, Machiavelli has a high view of sin, original sin. And he connects that with uh, Augustine. And he sometimes says, he calls it, are you going to appeal to the beasts? He's talking about humans, meaning their original sin aspect. Or are you going to appeal to them as proper? Uh, And he says, it is necessary for a prince to understand how to avail himself to the beast and to uh, the man, meaning the wise man. Uh, Therefore, a wise Lord cannot nor ought not to keep faith when such observance may be turned against him, when the reasons that uh, caused him to pledge it no longer exist. Okay, if you make a, I'm going to do X, feel free to just change that. You don't have to follow your promises. Why? If men were entirely good, this precept that you should follow your promises would be true. But because they are bad, they will not keep faith with you. And you are not bound to observe it with them. You make a promise, break the promise, they're evil too. Won't bother them, especially if it helps them. 
Uh, but it's necessary to know how to disguise this characteristic. Uh, and to be a great pretender, uh, men are so simple and subject to present necessities that he who seeks to deceive, the prince who seeks to deceive, will always find someone who will allow himself to be deceived, especially if it's to their benefit. Uh, uh, okay, I need to stop. Uh, talking. And you can see in your discussion group number three, I say, what issues or life situations tempt you to use the principle that the end justifies the means? And we're all subject to that uh, temptation in life. And as Paul says, that's an absurdity. Why not do evil that good may come? The people who slanderously charge us with that, their condemnation is just, and you could see how Machiavelli's uh, ethic uh, is taken over by many people, uh, and many, uh, in fact, even some, the radicals of both political parties sometimes will argue. It's a utilitarian argument. Uh, well, yeah, we got to do this little bad thing because overall, it's better if our candidate gets elected. That the means by which you get there are inconsequential because it's so important, the ends. Now, from a Christian perspective, they all have to be appropriate. Again, there are some situations where you got to do some pretty hard means, like putting somebody in a prison, uh, and, and that it can be appropriate in situations. But I'm not sure how do we end here. Do I pray? <laughs> I'm done. Uh, what do we do here? <laughs>